a lot of the ISVs are really coming to us now and going, what, what can we do to build checks in? Well, Patty, today we talked about checks, ACH, and this kind of whole world that I know is much more your world. Much so more my I, world. I, 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 I felt like I was like, wow, this is my, these are my people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's very interesting. There's actually a lot of opportunity still. People might think, oh, nobody's writing checks, but actually there's still a lot of checks. There's, there's a lot of opportunity with ACH. We right. talked about buy now, pay later. So this is a really good one for those who maybe are newer to the industry as well to get an understanding of this other world of check processing so that in these businesses you're selling where there's an opportunity there, you can you take advantage well. of it. Right. You know, um, right. I talked in the uh, questions in the field about scaling your business. And I just talked about the idea of resource allocation and people selection. And just really what are the important questions that you have to ask yourself as your business grows in order to keep it growing while also remaining, uh, you know, having some work-life balance and yeah. having a good yeah. life along the way. And then Patty, tell us about the insiders today. Uh, insiders is an update on uh, Durbin redo, as I call it. Um, that's uh, Senator Durbin's um, efforts to um, throw a wrench in the works of credit card processing. Yeah. Um, and uh, James, I think you want to do your disclaimer now. Uh, yeah. So Travis and uh, Crosscheck, neither of them are paying me in any way or, or, or uh, Patty and I, were, they're not consulting clients or advertisers. Nope. Just a great conversation with a longtime industry veteran. So with that being said, let's dive in. Hey, everybody. James and I are here today with my old friend, Travis Powers. Travis, how you doing? I'm doing really well. Doing good. very well. Good, good. And uh, great to have you on the on the podcast. Thanks for uh, coming. Uh as Travis knows, and, and and people who have known me for a long time know, I'm sort of like a check maven. So I've been looking for an excuse to, <laughs> to talk about checks, even though I admit they are slipping away. Um, yeah. If you look at the latest Fed data, but there's still a lot of there's still billions and billions of checks being written every year. So um, anyway, but Travis, I wanted to, the way we like to start off these uh, podcasts is to get a idea of who we're talking to. So maybe you could fill in our audience on, you know, how you got into the business and, uh, you know, sort of your your path. As I understand it, you've been with Crosscheck pretty much your whole career, right? A, a lot of my career, um, definitely. Patty, thank you for having me on the show. I, re I really appreciate that. First of all, I always like the opportunity to talk about checks. It's um, one of the big questions that we get every single day from our, from our ISOs and Right. Our ISPs is who who writes checks, and right. uh, in today's world, and uh, but you know I can kind of give you a little bit of my background if you would like, yeah, um, to start off. For if sure. that sounds good, yeah, um, yeah. I started with Crosscheck in 1989 um, as a collector, and oh, wow. I while I was in college, and I collected for Crosscheck for about a year, and. Um, at that time, I was working directly with Paul Green and the crew that was running Crosscheck. Um, and a couple of my friends even came and from that I worked with, I went to school with, and we all continued to do collections for the group. But I went off and became a banker um, for the better part of eight years for Wells Fargo. Um, and I yeah. did during during my eight years at Wells Fargo. I literally had about 15 jobs um, <laughs> within that. And a lot of it was um, they had a management track that you went through to learn how everything from P what they call POD, point of distribution of how the checks flow through the system on deposits um, all the way up. I even did commercial lending at one point um, with the bank and it was a big exposure. And at one point um, at the end of 99, uh, I, one of my friends who had continued to work at Crosscheck lured me back to come run the ISO ISV channel mm -hmm. uh, for Crosscheck, and I've been doing that for close to 24 years now. Yeah, I wow. saw your uh, I saw your post the other day. I think it was on LinkedIn. Like, I can't believe it's been 24 years. Yeah, no, exactly. Crosscheck is only what about 40 years old. So you Actually, know that's like better than half of the company's uh, time here. Yeah, no, absolutely, and. A lot of people don't know, Patty, that uh, Crosscheck was um, one of the first ISOs. Yes. And oh, wow. Amcor. Um, and so um, that's been a lot of my background um, is working with the ISOs um, early on and developing a lot of the products we have over the years 
mm -hmm. um, and doing that. But yeah, the 25 of the 40 years I've spent, and even some of the years when I was a banker, I was still a ISO selling cross check on the side. Mm. Uh huh. Uh huh. Wow. And, and we, probably also worth telling, uh, you know, you mentioned Paul Green, and of course, Paul Green was the founder of the Green Sheet, in addition to being one of the original founders of Crosscheck. So it all kind of comes around. In fact, that's how I met Paul. I was back in the 90s. I used to do these conferences. Uh, I called them Chexpo, you know, the uh, evolution of checks, the electronification, I used to call it. And that, that was, you know. And that you was, called the term and I've, and I've used it for years and years and years. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and, and it's, uh, that's how I met Paul, because he was, hmm. you know, following checks and uh, it well, all came to be. Um, anyway, I would love it, Travis, if you could explain to our listeners the reality of check payments. You know, a lot of people, and we all know that, you know, among consumers, we can say, hey, who writes checks, right? I mean, but uh, there's still a lot of people that write checks, especially uh, baby boomers, you know, yeah. um, but there's also a lot of B2B activity in checks. And um, I also know that there's a lot of uh, C to B activity in checks. So maybe if you could give us a little, you know, snapshot of, of the check marketplace. Well, I always, and I will happy to do that. <clears throat> and, you know, I can throw out the funny statistics. I saw something earlier today um, that the silent generation still prefers um, check payments about at 31% mm -hmm. baby boomers. Their preferred payment is checks at 23%. Gen X is at 15 and then millennials are at eight. So exactly yeah. what you said, Patty, it's, <laughs> right. it is trailing, it is trailing off, but with the advent of, you know, real-time payments, I think we're, we're in a very, very exciting time right now in payments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm going to say that I can remember back to my early days at Crosscheck when we, we actually got right before I came to Crosscheck, we left as an ISO and stopped selling merchant services and concentrated on checks mm -hmm. for, for the good or the bad Right um, at that time. But I can remember back, you know, it was probably around 83 that Verifone launched its terminal mm -hmm. and it was right. the first modern terminal. And, right. you know, you know, ISOs and ISVs for 20 years kind of sold the same widget. It got better, but that terminal was, it was delivering terminals to people that were doing paper slips Mm -hmm. for you for 20 years right, right. and and um and you know and look at where we are today it's such a huge business i think in 2000 i think i saw a stat the other day you know there's a 70 percent jump in fees on interchange swipe fees um from 64 billion in 2010 to almost 110 billion in 2020 and to a large extent that's the hard work of isos and isvs um right doing that work of getting equipment out. But there's so much more than that today. Obviously, we all know with contactless, online, digital, frictionless, um, speedier payments, A to A, B to B, cross-border, you know, we could kind of NFTs, right, right. digital wallets, P to P, you can kind of surcharging. Um, and I'll probably land there before, and I'll talk about checks. Surcharging has been a boom for me in my oh, business. Interesting. Uh-huh. And a lot of it is, is that as, um, you know, we've always concentrated in certain marketplaces and higher dollar ticket um, has been where we guarantee checks mm -hmm. and surcharging. You know, when you start looking at a ticket of a thousand bucks, somebody's going, well, it's $30 to use your credit card. Right. A lot of people are willing to pull out their checkbook to avoid paying that 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I've done it. You know, and, and I've done it. And it's funny is I didn't see it a lot, you know, several years ago is, you know, we start going to the trade shows, you see the search, you know, and I say surcharging, I mean, cash is coming. Right. What, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever, whatever we need to call it today, but okay. passing on that fee to use the credit card um, has, I've got folks that haven't sold for me for 10 years that are, you know, I always say jokingly coming out of the woodwork, calling my cell phone and going, Hey, I'm not sure this is still your number, <laughs> but you know, they, they're coming back and they are selling it. And 
there are lots of opportunities um, that are arising from that because folks are paying with checks and, and merchants are asking, what do I, you know, what's the alternative, right? What's the alternative? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, the ISVs are finally even looking at using our APIs and there's other groups that have used these APIs for ACH and stuff over mm -hmm. the years, but a lot of the ISVs are really coming to us now and going, what, what can we do to build checks in to our offerings? Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, what might be really helpful here, Travis, before we, you know, go too much deeper into this, let's talk about the services that a company like yours would offer, because I think it, for our audience, you know, to your point, I mean, people that got into this industry in the last five years, they may never have sold check processing services. Now, I, I certainly, I, I used to sell it all the time, right? But, right. but it, you know, what is a check processing service? Give us some of the the ideas, the high points of like what that actually means. What kind of services do you provide? Um, we don't even call it check processing. We just call it payment guarantee. Um, and a lot of it is that we provide, um, find, there, there's something that Patty will laugh a little bit about, but finality of payment. Right. Um, and, um, and the reason I say Patty will laugh at it is most ISOs and ISVs don't understand that when you write a check and you fill it out properly and that check is negotiated, the it's done. done deal. There, there, there's no, there's no charge back, right. Um, right. in that process, but back to what we offer is we do offer that ability for merchants to process an item. We, um, in some cases we and in most cases, we provide a guarantee that if that check is presented NSF, UCF, stop payment, whatever, whatever that is, and comes back, that we stand in in that transaction and the merchants um, credited uh, for that transaction, we do the collections. We're a fully licensed and bonded collection agency also in all 50 states. Hmm. So right, we... So so maybe a, so maybe a way to restate that for those that maybe aren't as familiar. If, correct me if I'm wrong here, Travis. But the idea would be, let's say I'm selling a auto repair shop, and they do a lot of let's say transmission work. So they're doing you know, seven hundred to two thousand dollar transactions quite a bit. And someone writes them a check. You would give them the ability to run that check through like a scanner. I would imagine kind of an imaging thing, and and then that would convert that check into like a digital transaction, so to speak. And then if that check bounces then that auto repair shop, they still get their money. And then your company goes after that consumer to, to get that payment. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. You're, you're uh, James, you're hard. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's too busy, Travis. <laughs> yeah, you don't want but, me. <laughs> but the, but, uh, but that, you know, I will say, but there's so much more to it than that. And, sure. and for the larger players, like large national auto dealers, right. um, you can, most people know the names of them. You know, we process billions of dollars for those guys. And a lot of it is it's um, doing file feeds to them at night. Um, we recently did a overhead garage door company group that really didn't have a bad check problem, but um, just being able to take all their locations, process their items, give them access to those items to look at for whatever reasons, for mm -hmm. reconciliations, um, hooking those up to purchase orders, all the things that credit card, you know, folks are doing with credit cards today. Right. We do check side um, mm -hmm. and make it easy. And we do it, you know, it is significantly, you know, we're, we're probably somewhere between half and a quarter of the cost right. of a credit card all right. to guarantee the item. Right. Right. Exactly. Circumstances. So we're, uh, we're cheaper more often than not. And we, but we also have other components that we offer, um, you know, one of the new hot things right now is buy now, pay later. Everybody's right. talking about it. You know, the affirms of the world, the afterpays, PayPal, all these guys have gotten into this. Um, I think that they're projecting buy now, pay later to be almost a billion dollars by 2026. Well, right. guess what? I've been doing this for 35 years. Hmm. We right. Right. given merchants the ability to take anywhere from two, three, even four checks over 30, 60, even 90 days without a credit check, make a sale happen um, by the consumer just agreeing to make those payments. And we right. step in and provide a guarantee. You mentioned auto after, you know, one of the things I teach ISS all the time is a mechanic's job is not to fix a car. It's to find something else wrong with a vehicle. <laughs> right. Turn a $250 sale into a $500 sale. Well, we all know from the statistics that we read in the payment journals all the time that 
half of America can't afford a $400 unexpected expense right now. Not everybody's got a 700 credit score. Not everybody has a credit card with an open to buy, even though um, everybody thinks that everybody's got a credit card and the credit card, um, you know, in the ISO and ISV world. But really what it does is it just gives the merchants an alternative to go, hey, can I split this up over two payments over the next 30 days? Right. And so basically, so that, in, in effect, you're saying in that scenario, the, the consumer would basically be writing a post-dated check. Is that the idea? Um, not post-dated. They, they, they write them today. They're dated today. But it's it's an it's a basically an agreement between the consumer and the merchant to take mm-hmm. payments. Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of laws around checks that uh, you don't, okay. don't write post dated checks. But right, right. all that being said, there we we read those checks, put them through our system. We know when to electronically deposit them for a merchant. So mm-hmm. let's say fifteen hundred dollar bill, they write two checks for seven fifty. They we can process one today and one thirty days from now. The merchant mm-hmm. gets his money when the checks are processed, right? But they're going to get their money. Yeah, but you gar- right. you're guaranteeing the checks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, okay. we developed this product. Um, believe it or not, one of our salespeople, it back in the late '80s, came to us and said, "A hey, car dealers really need somebody to stand in when um, somebody's buying a car, mm-hmm. and you know they they lose a lot of sales at the point of sale." Because um, the person doesn't have fifteen hundred dollars. I mean, I mean, think about it today. I think the average cost of a car is almost forty nine thousand dollars now. Right, right. And most folks have got to come up with some kind of earnest money. Right. Um, nobody, not everybody, can walk out financing one hundred and twenty percent of the vehicle, and especially with the lending tightening up these right. days. Sure. And so, Crosscheck gives our auto dealers the ability to take a down payment that, you know, in most of the, and have it guaranteed, dealers don't want to eat. They only have about a 4% margin in a new car normally. Right. Don't want to pay 3%. Of course. You know, we're seeing more and more. um, Interesting. Yeah. We're seeing more and more uh, surcharging cash, cash discounting in car dealers. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. I I consult for several ISOs that that's all they do. Right. So yeah. Now you mentioned you mentioned auto repair car dealers maybe real quickly you know give us the 30 second version of some other verticals what are some other verticals that are really popular with the the what you guys it, do anything to do with the trades um building supply building material carpet uh, you know I always think anything that goes on a house or in a house um mm-hmm. furniture um is right. a big spot for us anywhere where the average ticket um is over $500 um right. and a lot of B2B. We're seeing a lot more um, electrical supply companies, um, drip and irrigation companies. You know, b- there's still a ton of B2B checks out there. Oh, yeah. It's very interesting in the ISV world and the ISO world because we have those conversations and we find out that the merchants aren't asking the ISO about checks. But the problem is, is as you said, it, a lot of people that have recently gotten into the industry that don't write checks just forget to ask. It's it's one of the reasons Patty's aware of this, but it's one of the reasons why we have a direct sales force also mm-hmm. um, past our ISOs. Our ISOs still contribute a large piece, but our direct sales force goes in behind a ton of um, folks that are out there selling. And, you know, and, and we hear it from merchants all the time. Well, they didn't know who to go to. Right. Yeah. Can you talk just, just real briefly, kind of give us sort of a start to finish how you actually mitigate um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, the vast majority, I mean, we, Patty, you will, you'll laugh a little bit. We still have folks that call in over the phone to approve checks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and what, and often in those situations there, we're, we're running a driver's license and do keeping a negative database on driver's license. But, you know, the vast majority of our clients today are using remote deposit capture right. where they're scanning a check. We have an algorithm that looks at the check, looks at the driver's license. We're bouncing it off several national databases, um, such as early warning, um, that give us scoring that we can do. Um, nobody can look, you know, contrary to what everybody says, nobody really can look in real time quickly whether or not there's money in an account. Right. Unless there, it's, there are some companies out there that have you log into your banking and they can scrape the data. But for a quick POS transaction, 
that's not feasible. Right. But what we're doing is looking at the MICR. We're looking at the driver's license. We're looking at the dollar amount. We're looking at the merchant demographics. All those different things kind of come into play on making a decision on whether to give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down. The vast, vast majority get an approval, um, like well into the 90 percentile. But we also catch a lot of checks that were quote unquote created. Um, is what I always say, you know, in the back of a truck or something, right. um, you know, and we catch those um, and say no to them for the merchant. So we're protecting the merchant, not only up front, but we're also protecting the merchant on the back end with the guarantee. So, um, you know, one of the things I was curious about is what do you tell an ISO? So let's say an ISO reaches out to you today and they say, hey, we're thinking about offering check services um, what's the pitch to them? What's the elevator pitch of of the, the value for them in, in reselling what you have to offer? Well, the first thing that we really do is we really take a look at the ISO and do they have the, first of all, do they have the chops um, mm -hmm. in, in the right industries? You know, I wouldn't, right. I don't even want to talk to an ISO or an ISV that's dealing mostly in restaurants. I right. mean, the reality is, is there's no checks there. We want to make right. sure that, you know, it's a mutually beneficial relationship and uh, our our pitch today um, is, please let us help you. Um, I've got a staff here of folks that we become the check arm of the ISO. So mm -hmm. we really want them just to find the opportunity. So we do the training, we um, find the opportunity, and then it and we pay them the same way. Um, and that could be anywhere from buy rates um, to um, a percentage of gross revenue, or even um, some folks even own half their portfolio with us. Mm. Um, you know some of the big players in the industry, and they still they still own half their portfolio. Right. Um, we set them up as a separate check company within CrossCheck. They can know their top ten offenders, their top ten, you know, producers, and right. But a lot of it is it's training um, mm. and hand holding of the ISO. Um, we we have a couple of unique programs, like we lend out equipment. We don't allow our ISOs really to sell equipment. Um, we don't want to get into that world. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of it is, is just figuring out where they're going, figuring out there is no interchange in our business. It's bad checks. Right. James. So we, we have to figure out what kind of business they're going after. And then we can figure out what their margins are probably going to be, you know, are they going to sell one account a month or 12 accounts or 200 accounts a month? Right. Um, and then, figuring out a symbiotic relationship. We really want our ISOs to build a residual stream. You know, I've still got ISOs that haven't sold for me since 1995 that are still collecting a check from us. And, you know, the cross checks unique in the industry is that we've, we've never missed a residual payment in 40 years. Wow. That's awesome. That's quite a that's reputation. Awesome. Believe it or not, Patty, I'm still paying on the Amcor portfolio today. <laughs> I was just wondering about that. Is Paul still collecting? <laughs> I am sure. I'm sure. I don't know if Paul is, but uh, but at the same point, I've, I've got a few Amcor reps that are still still get a check from me. Yeah. So Travis, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to, wanted to have you on today is I I ran into you, I believe, at um, one of the regional conferences, a couple of the regional conferences, and I was really taken by the fact that you were sort of promoting cross check as a uh, compatriot, shall we say, to um, the dual pricing um, sales pitch, you know, helping out, you know, offering a, another alternative to cash. Um, and as I understand it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not just the way you would um, support that would is not just with check, but with ACH services as well, right? Is that... Oh. Absolutely. Um, and and you also do something that kind of ties into mobile deposit or, uh, you know, remote deposit capture. Could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, so, um, you know, mobile banking has been around at making a check for, you know, taking a picture of a check for, for a long period of time. Right, and right, and right. unfortunately, there was, there's one player in the industry that kind of holds the patent on it. And I uh -huh. think for Time, they didn't see the the merchant as a revenue source. They always saw banks, right? As, right. And and you know we're taking what we've done is we basically taken the teller window all the way back to the merchant with our mobile deposit um, product. We we've managed to get the pricing to where it kind of works um, um, for everybody in that sense. But 
it's it's very interesting with um, more and more the terminals not being multi-app terminals. We're seeing more and more people turn to tablets, turn to phones. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we still have our our check imagers that are connected to PCs, right? Today, but they're but, collecting dust, probably. <laughs> yeah, and but we're seeing a lot at the mobile. And, and to be honest with you, I was I was completely wrong. I thought it was always going to be Stanley Steamers. Atlas van moving people that were truly mobile using it. Yes. Right. We are seeing a ton of usage at mattress stores, flooring stores, you know, furniture stores. Um, we had a furniture group that um, large one that starts with a uh, kind of tell everybody <laughs> that they, they literally all the salespeople walk around with a tablet. Well, they'll sit down when they're buying the dining room table, write the check at the dining room table, take a picture of it and deposit it and have it guaranteed. That's cool. You know, so it's, you know, buy now, pay later, cash discounting. They've all kind of been reinvigorated our, I don't, we've never been declining, but right. what's, <laughs> what's been declining is the old mom and pop on the street using us. Right. Really, our ISOs have gotten better about selling bigger deals now. Right. So I'm selling less deals today than I was 10 years ago, but I'm selling deals that are vastly outpacing any of the usage that I ever used to get. Right. Yeah. I remember, you know, years ago, um, I'm big into audio. I'm an audiophile and I, you know, would always like trick out every car with the best you know, audio equipment, and right, and and it, and it's funny because it was, you know, you'd go to there, and of course, in those days, we're talking like the '80s and the '90s, James. Um, <laughs> those days, you would go and you'd write a check because to get that right. stereo in your car is going to be close to eight or nine hundred dollars, which was a lot of money in those days. Right. And um, you know, and I remember they would do they, you know, dial somebody up and say, you know, and, you know, here's the license number and here's the mic or number, and you know, when I think about it now, of course, those places are are no longer with us. But just the idea that you could go in, hand them a check, they can take a picture. That's like a whole yeah. new. Well, and you know, let, let, let's face it, the uh, the check imagers were never exactly, uh, you know, the best piece of technology. I no, mean, at least the ones no. I always dealt with seemed to break. You know, if anything was going to break in a merchant location, it was going to be the check imager as a general rule. Yeah. Um, so I think pro- probably merchants are so tired of those things. And that when the idea of they can use their mobile phone and app, they're probably like, oh, sign me up for that. Forget this stupid check imager. Right. I just, exactly. I- just did a 14 location mattress store that had all thin clients. Nothing was going to connect to it. We ended up using a $49 Amazon you know, track phone. Right. At all the locations <laughs> that connect via Wi Fi to the system. And he uses the track phones yep. to do it. You know, and, yeah. and the reality is, is that check imagers are not cheap. No. Right. But a $49 track phone to do it is cheap. Right. And, and, and probably more know, dependable. Yeah, And it's very interesting is, is that, you know, our big piece and push with our ISOs, um, Patty is training, you know, James Patty, it, it's training, telling them how to recognize an opportunity, getting, you know, you can't replace I, my counterpart here is Todd Little. Um, a lot of people in the industry know him. He's a, he's, he's a football coach. That's a tr- national trainer for us. He coaches, he's um one of the JC football teams here in the area, but he's just an exciting guy. He knows how to go, teach. go, go. Yeah. Right. I've seen go, go, go. Teach, yeah. teach. We teach our folks to recognize those opportunities. And then they bring in between Todd and I, we've got 50 years of, um, plus of experience. We come in and present the solutions and it usually closes itself um, on that. I mean, we, we probably close 75 ish percent of the deals that ISOs bring to us. And a lot of the time, the other, a lot of the time too, sometimes it's just not an opportunity, but they thought it was. Mm-hmm. Right. And as you know, one of the products you mentioned earlier that I didn't is we are guaranteeing ACHs now. Mm-hmm. We have a pay by link that allows a merchant to send a link to a consumer. They can put in their routing and account number, have that transaction guaranteed. Um, and that's another one. You know, at first I thought it was going to be people buying stuff from home, um yeah like ACH for like online buying right like yeah a, yeah it, and it's not it, it what it's huh. become a lot of folks go get to a car dealer and go 
well, I don't have my checkbook with me. Right. Fine. We'll Nobody carries checks anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and we hmm. fine. We'll send you a link. Um, you fill out your routing and account number. We'll get the get the deal done now because you know at a car dealer you, you want the right set of tail lights to go over the curb. Right. And that's the one that they're buying, not right. the wrong the wrong sets their current car. Right. Right. And um hmm. and you don't want to tell people go get a go get a cashier's check. Oh, you don't have your checkbook with you? You know, fine. We can send you a link. You know, we give ISOs the opportunity to solve problems for the merchant. And, you know, it, it's a very, we're less in cost to interchange, but also we take the whole process of taking checks to the bank away. That's a yeah. very expensive process. Very expensive process. Mm. Yeah. That was probably one of the biggest, when I used to write about RDC, remote deposit capture, that was one of the biggest things in B2B. How many, you know, how many hours a week are you wasting going to the bank to take checks, right? Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and I had a very, I was had a conversation with a treasury management person the other day with a very large um, 200 location plus company. Our ability to do both his check guarantee, check processing, and ACH. One of his biggest concerns, Patty, was not the cost. It was whether or not they were in compliance, having people working overtime by dropping checks at night drops, you know, and he just goes, solves a big issue for me because I don't have to worry about whether somebody's really on the clock, right? Not on the clock. Yeah. You know, and, or getting and, robbed. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that lastly was, he goes, the last thing I need is for a 110 pound woman to get absolutely beat up at a night drop. That she's right. dropping three, you know, three three items off at, right? And he goes, the the optics are just absolutely terrible for my company. Well, Travis, this has been really really insightful. I really appreciate you taking the time. I'm wondering, um, where would you send folks who want to learn more about cross check and potentially working with you? I, I would send them directly to us here um, with uh, both Todd and I, Todd Little and myself. We're happy to have a conversation with anybody that even remotely thinks that they've got opportunities to sell check and we'll help you overcome objections, make the sales. You know, I've got a team here that's ready to go and, you know, no deal is too big and no deal is too small for us. Um, on that side, we really do believe in building a residual stream and adhering to that 40 years of making payments to folks. Right. Love it. And what about your email address? Maybe that'd be a good. good oh, absolutely. Pretty, pretty easy. It's Travis at cross c r o s s hyphen check c h e c k dot com excellent excellent awesome. travis thanks thanks so much for uh speaking with us today james patty it was a pleasure and uh wish you the best and happy holidays this episode is brought to you by nativia banking if you want to learn more about how you can make residual income by providing banking services to your merchants or you'd like to get some banking services for yourself. You want to mm -hmm. set up your ISO the way that I have set up CC Sales Pro with uh, cards, virtual cards, one-time use cards, physical cards, all managed inside of a mobile app. It's really cool. Head over to nativia.com slash banking for that one or nativia.com slash ISO if you want to learn more about the reseller program. So Patty, today I just wanted to share a couple of quick things about scaling a business. Mm. This is more in general rather than just purely uh, payment processing, but um, it's something I, I've been thinking a lot about. And, mm. you know, when I was in my 20s and thinking about, man, you know, I'm going to be so successful and, you know, everything. And, and in my mind, what success looked like at that time um, was very wrong. <laughs> you uh -huh, know, uh -huh. it's actually very different in, in reality. And so I wanted to just take a second to talk about the questions that you really are asking yourself when you become more successful and you're, and you're scaling businesses up. And you know, what they really center around is capital allocation and people selection. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and what's in, you know, my definition of success, and I know everybody is different, you know, right now I'm, I'm, uh, about two thirds of the way through the new, uh, Walter Isaacson book on Elon Musk. Um, and you know, his definition of success is, you know, being involved in every detail, sleeping mm -hmm. on the factory floor. Um, yeah. that's not my definition of success. No. Well, um, I can't, couldn't see you sleeping on a factory floor. And not my thing. No, <laughs> I'm going to be at home with my kids. Um, uh -huh. but, uh, for me, it's about, you know, putting the maximum amount of my time into capital allocation and people selection. And so what I mean by that right. is you get to a point, uh, in your career where 
you realize that there's actually a lot of other really smart people out there. You're not the only you're one, not the only one. Yeah. that's passionate about what you're doing. In fact, you're not even the smartest one, you know, <laughs> um, right? And you're, you're only, in your own... my thing is I'm only smart enough to realize I'm really not that smart. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so you, you get to a point too, where you just realize there's so much information out there that if you just are looking for the right data, um, you can you can make pretty good decisions, right? As mm -hmm. a, as a general rule, sure. um, and then you also learn that when you think you made a pretty good decision, you also realize that you probably didn't, and then you iterate and uh -huh. you change and you adapt. And so there's these kind of sure. this idea of strategy of just like here's the direction I want to go, here's the objective I'm trying to accomplish, and I know that I'm going to make some bad decisions, but I'm going to make those decisions quickly, and I'm going to learn as fast as I can whether or not I made the right decision or the wrong decision. When I realize right. it was wrong, I'm going to pivot. So. Once you kind of have that framework in your mind, then the only thing left is capital allocation and people selection. How much is it going to cost to do this idea? Right. Where am I going to get the money to do it? And who's going to be the person that's going to run it? And while I think these sound so basic, um, usually good advice does sound really basic. I've learned that sure. over the years that I talk to people that know a lot more. It seems like the more that people know when I talk to them, the advice they give me is like really profound, but actually really obvious and simple. But mm -hmm. the truth is what you really need to be focusing on in your business is where are you going to get more capital? Because ideas are very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that can be a combination of things. You know, my preferred method is always cash flow. That's my ideal way to fund ideas. So I have different business units, some that are throwing off a lot of cash, some that are eating up a lot of cash and hopefully a little bit left over in the middle that I can use for yeah, my family right. and other things. Right. Right. Um, sure. But also other places, you know, I'll go to the banks, you know, a lot of my friends go to outside investors, private equity firms, venture capital, et cetera. Um, and right. so thinking about that in terms of where are you going to get the money to fund the idea? And then what I personally have come to believe is the most important part of, of the equation is who's going to run it. Yes. And of course, these ideas overlap because you have to have money in order to hire and, and compensate and keep really good people on your team. But ultimately, if you want to, you know, I get a lot of people that will say things to me like, you know, uh, it's funny, even uh, Obi Rawls had a conversation with him just a few weeks ago. And and um, he's like, man, how are you doing all this? Because I he's, he, I got this business going and this one and I'm doing, you know, and I right now I'd say I have probably six really significant business ventures going on. And at the same time, I'm getting a lot more involved right now with some things in my church. And I've been there for 15, 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I stop work at five o'clock most days right now and go home with my family. And right. so the way that I do that is by, I invest really heavily in people and, and I have yeah. fantastic people that are running each of these things that we're doing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so you, you know, most of them, Patty, um, sure. you know, and so having these really good people there and then another, just one of the story I'll share real quick. Um, my, I have somebody who does payroll and we were having this conversation, uh, recently and they were saying, you know, you need to restructure some of your bonuses that you're paying to people because it's getting ridiculous. It's getting kind of out of control. You know, they're making so much money. And, and I was like, no, you don't understand. Like you have to recognize the market value of these people. They could go right, other places sure. and make this kind of money. And so I'm paying them because number one, I know that I'm making a lot more money than I'm spending there. But the other right. big reason is me having these people and paying them that much money. That's what allows me to go home at five o'clock yes. and not right. check my phone because I know things are taken care of. I'm not worried if I have a day where I don't, you know, don't want to come into the office till 11 or whatever, you know, I can plan that. I got to plan it ahead because I have two people full time that do my schedule. So they schedule me out sure. pretty good. But, but, you know, I can, I have that freedom to do that. And, you know, like right now I'm more involved with my church and working with the youth group again and things like that. And it's like, I can do that because I have these people that are each running these different business units. Mm -hmm. And so it, it gives me that flexibility. Now, of course, you know me, I mean, I'm, I'm, definitely tend towards the workaholic thing. And so yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I do like to jump in, but, but you know, what's exciting is when you get to the point where you're spending most of your time developing those key people that are running the business mm -hmm. and securing access to capital and making sure whether, again, whether that's through cash flow, which is my preferred method or right. through debt or through outside investors, making sure you have enough money to fund your ambition and then getting the right people. So I don't know if that's going to help anybody today, but just as you're thinking about scaling your business and maybe defining what success looks like for you, I would encourage you to think more in terms of capital allocation, um, you know, resource allocation, and then people selection and training. Um, mm -hmm. Those are really the keys as you get larger. Okay. So James, opposition to the Credit Card Competition Act is beginning to take shape. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, here. that's the bill, of course, that was introduced by uh, Senator Dick Durbin, the Illinois Republican who brought us the Durbin Amendment that regulated debit interchange. This right. time around, um, Senator Durbin thinks he can drive down interchange by forcing competition for 
network traffic. Right. Um, we've talked about this before, but just as a brief synopsis, the bill would require that merchants get to get a choice uh, right. from two networks to process their payment card payments, and only one of those choices can be Visa or MasterCard. Right. Um, now, if enacted, of course, this legislation would require card issuers to make sure their cards can process across multiple networks. So it means millions of cards are going to have to be reissued. Right. That's just one of the little not, not to mention nobody even knows what this means yet right, of, of right. processing on multiple networks. Which right, is of kind course. Of a, anyway, yeah, whole other thing. But but it, but it, you know it's it's one of those ideas that's being you know pushed by retail trade groups and their big name members like Walmart. Sure. Um, you know, but um, you know, and I've I've talked before about how I felt that the industry, our industry, was not taking as proactive a stance right. as it could. Yes. And I think finally they are. Um, and I, I was really struck recently by, uh, an attack against the, an attack on the legislation from a group calling itself the small business payments Alliance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now there's no telling, you know, who or what is actually behind the group. I suspect it could be, you know, some, some banks or, you know, uh, right. bank trade groups like the electronic payments. Um, what is that coalition council? Oh yeah. The council, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, this group describes itself as, as, as small business owners, entrepreneurs, and tradespeople who oppose what they describe as bad policy, um, rather than helping merchants as Senator Durbin and his allies say the group in a press release, um, sent out, uh, just before Thanksgiving, which I thought mm -hmm. was great timing. Um, described the Credit Card Competition Act as, quote, a direct threat to the electronic payment system. Hmm. If enacted, the group insisted it would harm small businesses and entrepreneurs and tradespeople by circumventing the existing free market with a government mandate. Wow. Strong yeah. words. Yeah, strong words. It also echoed some other points made by opponents, um, like security concerns. Um now, Senator Durbin and his allies, both uh, Democrats and Republicans, insist the legislation will be beneficial to merchants and consumers, uh, opponents, you know, by namely by reducing interchange. But, you know, opponents note that the same outcome was promised with passage of the Durbin Amendment, and that didn't happen. Hmm. Um, this time around, opponents say the potential loss of debit rewards program will render small businesses the big, uh, big losers, because a hmm. lot of small businesses rely on those rewards programs. Yeah, You know, one uh, small business owner in Detroit uh, that was quoted by the uh, Business Payments Alliance in its press release, put it this way, quote, the benefits we, along with our customers, gain from cashback rewards and credit card acceptance far outweigh the card fees we put, we pay. Huh. Um, another guy, a bodega owner in Atlanta, said he was concerned that his business lacked the technology and intellectual capital needed to take advantage of a policy like this unlike the mega retailers, which, which I think is exactly is, what would happen. Exactly yeah. what would happen, you know. Um, now, Durbin and his allies have said they believe there's enough support for the bill to be voted on during the current session of Congress. That ends next December. I'm not buying that, though. Um, a standalone bill, you know, it, it's pretty hard to take a standalone bill and bring it straight to the floor. Yeah. Um, and there's been, you know, the legislative process includes committee hearings and votes in both the Senate and the House. And there's been no hearings to date, um, right. although I will note that Senator Sherrod Brown, uh, who chairs the Senate Banking Committee, has said that he's open to the idea of hearings. Hmm. Now, you know, like I said, this current this legislation uh, stands until the end of the current Congress, which is next the end of next December. So okay. they still got a year. But I think that it's really yeah. interesting that we're, we're starting to hear from people, um, not just the banks and the card um brands but from other people saying no wait hold it yeah. hold it good yeah. yeah well you know my my feelings on this i think our audience knows how i feel oh, yeah. about this one so yeah yeah, so yeah. Watch which the is space yeah which is interesting since i've been a big proponent of you know some forms of kind of checks and balances on interchange and right. and even sure. at one point i even had the free market interchange petition that i i did uh oh i don't but, remember that <laughs> yeah that was a long time ago it was okay. doing our processors but we were we, basically we were doing a petition that the idea was that I I believe that the, one of the big drivers of change here would be Visa, MasterCard, whoever it is, when they send the authorization code back through the networks, 
uh -huh. they have to include the cost of interchange on that particular transaction. Oh, interesting. Right. And that would give a lot of the ability to pass those costs on to consumers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Give sure. the ability for the car brands to do more like smart regulations. So like, mm -hmm. you know, they just did the uh, surcharge cap at 3%. Right. Well, what if instead they could say the surcharge cap was the cost of interchange plus 50 basis points? Sure. Right. But right. they can't do that because they don't send the cost of interchange back, you know, with the mm -hmm. authorization. You don't know the interchange cost till later. You don't know what the inter. Yeah. I mean, there's zillions <clears throat> of them. Right. right. So, you know, so I, I'm a big proponent of things that are that are practical, that are free market, sure. you know, principles. But sure. this is just an this absolute is not free disaster market. from every possible angle. It's ridiculous. So, every possible. It will, I mean, it, it's clearly you know. conceived of by people who don't really understand the system. No. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and huge companies like Walmart and Target and others who have the IT resources to take advantage of legislation right. that's opaque and, and complex and all of that, you know what I mean? Sure. So yeah. yeah, good stuff, Patty. Definitely keep us updated on this one for sure. I will. Sure.